Satish. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, probably my first time to this uh, meetup group. Lovely to see you all uh, after your work, tired, and you come to here to listen to my talk. So this is what I'm going to talk today. So uh, this is going to be a talk on Knative. So uh, if you want to go for the, the slides which I'm going to share today, so those are available here, right there. Bitly.ly can serving. You can pull these slides from there. And you can also reach out to my social handles. Um, this is my email and my Twitter handles. So uh, if you have any questions after the session or any time you want to reach out to me on any technical stuff related to Knative or Java, anything, please feel to drop a note to me. Um, all right, so uh, I'm not going to go through all the slides today. So what I'll do is like I have a lot of demo lined up. So I'll show you demos, how it actually works in the real environment. And then probably the slides are public, as I told you. So you can just grab the slides and follow it up again. All right, so this is what I work for in Red Hat. So I work for uh, an entity within Red Hat called as Red Hat Developers. So we kind of uh, talk to developers, meet the community, talk about the good things we are doing in upstream and then Java and all these stuff. And then we actually have lots and lots of contents as well available here where you can go and grab this content as well. So we write blogs, we have live webinars. Uh, probably the right now the webinars are running in US East time zone every fortnightly, which is called as Dev Nation Live. It's as a YouTube channel as well. So if you want to log into that, then once you register that, you can access the content, offline content of the YouTube videos so that you can see what the contents, technical content we talk about as well. Uh, so this is a little bit about myself, um, probably. So I'm kind of a active open source contributor to Knative uh, and Minishift, which is a single node OpenShift cluster. And then I've been contributing to Eclipse J and Fabric platform and all this stuff. And then I was also a creator for Vertex Maven plugin, so which is used to run your Vertex uh, applications as well. All right, so uh, the commands I'm going to type today, uh, don't worry if you miss my commands. Uh, so all these resources are there. So the left-hand side, I have uh, three blogs written last couple of months back, so which talks about Knative build, Knative serving, each and every building block that we're going to see today. Uh, and the right hand side, you have the GitHub links uh, where you can go grab those sources, the commands which I typed today, everything is documented there. So it's going to be step by step. You can see and do kind of things, right? So you don't, don't worry about that. You can just look on to what I do so that you can grab your uh, resources later and then start practicing yourself if you wish to, right? All right, so um, the one of the fundamental question that you ask yourself before you actually go and say why I need to go to serverless, right? So this is the fundamental two questions which you need to answer yourself. Whether you want to have an apps and API organization as a strategic advantage for your organization, or you regard IT as a cost center. For example, like most of the IT centers here which lives in Singapore, most of them are cost centers where they want to cut costs uh, rather than build anything like you're going to be an app or API uh, serving that's can be done here, right? So today probably what I'll touch upon is that I'll see how we can use Knative to kind of reduce your costs rather than the other one like building an apps and API as well. All right, this is a fair uh, bit of uh, definition, the formal definition of a serverless computing. So probably I'll skip this for now. Uh, I can just read it offline, just, just a definition uh, officially from CNCF, uh, Cloud Nighting Computing Foundation. Um, so one thing which I want to burst in this session is probably like if you're new to Knative, uh, Knative or serverless, I would rather I call serverless, if you're new to serverless, then imagine that serverless is not that I don't have servers, right? This is a myth which people say, look, if you have serverless, there is no servers, right? So it's nothing like that. So there are servers. Only thing which we do is that when it has a servers, so we make a physical box is running on operating system, but they run on demand. So that's what we mean to say, right? Whenever I need to scale up, scale down, so it comes up and goes out, go down automatically. So that's what serverless means. Still I have a, probably I might be having an AWS cloud or a Google cloud and have VMs deployed there, applications deployed there, but the applications will not be running 24 cross seven. So that, I, that was what I mean to say. Suddenly, for example, let's imagine a simple case. I have a cron job to run. So what happens, a cron job starts at 12 o'clock in the night and then it it's, uh, gets over at 12 five in the night. So I don't want to have the application running 24 cross seven to run this cron job. Instead, what I do is like I bring up the applications, let's say at 11.55, run the job at 12, and the job gets over 12 five, and then leave for five more minutes or something and then bring it down automatically. So these things has to be done automatically. Still we can do this without Knative. Before Knative when serverless was invented, it was done manually by the, your operational people. They go write some scripts, start the scripts, run it, execute it and bring the scripts down, right? Somebody was there to do it manually. Now we are trying to do it automated way kind of things. 
All right, this is a short history. Again, uh, I leave this to you for the offline read. I just, I just want to jump into demo as quickly as possible. Um, these are the four silos which I call for, for why I need to go for serverless. Right? Uh, the first thing is agility. The second one is event driven. And the third one is that I want to delegate uh, to focus platform and services to do all the infrastructure related stuff rather than I concentrate only on my business stuff rather than doing other stuff. And then I want a consistent and scalable operations across multiple applications, right? So whenever I scale up and scale down, it should be the same way I do for Java, it should be the same way I do for Node, it should be the same way I do for some other technology, right? And essentially what I do with like, I just have resource optimization and cost savings, which is, which is what we are talking about today. I said, as I said earlier, I'm going to talk more from the IT cost center side of things, right? This is what is serverless is going to give you as an immediate benefit for you. All right, so uh, before we get on demo, I just want to give a, a quick architectural evolution of how the architecture has evol evolved over the period. Like right now, these are the three uh, big architectural style which we follow. One is service, which is your client server model, your monolith applications and all these stuff. And then we have microservices, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we have functions. So, um, so we, these are the three, three different styles of architectural style that's right now any applications could be developed in. Uh, what I suggest is that um, people are seeing IT industry, right? It's quite common, right? So when something new is introduced, when the hype is created, people say, okay, everybody's going to go for serverless, right? So everybody's going to go for microservices, right? With respect of whether it's going to help you or it's not going to help you, I'm not, I'm not bothered about it. But I'm saying, okay, everybody's doing microservices, I want to do microservices. Everybody's doing serverless, I want to do serverless, right? But still, your application might be demanding that you run it as a monolith application, a service typical service-based architecture, you don't need a microservice at all, but still I like, go with that, right? So this is what you need to be conscious when you start doing things that way. For example, like when I want to have high control and high complexity, which means that, for example, I run a banking application which has confidential data, so I want to have more control on what I do, then it's preferred that you still say as mon monolith application within your data center, right? And then we have microservices where I want to have single purpose, stateless, no data, state, stateful state is maintained, independently scalable and automated, then I can go with microservices based architecture, right? And when I want something to be single action and ephemeral, then by default, go to functions. So these are the three different architectural styles which we can follow based. These are not the only use cases, but I'm just giving you the points, which means that it goes from high control, high complexity to low, low control and productivity. And then we have to stay in between if you want to have more productivity across. Great, so this is uh, something good and bad about serverless. Um, the, I think probably the good one, which is peak delivery speed, quicker and easier develop, development, automatic cost reduction, etc. The only thing is that still it's a messaging technology. So uh, the de there might not be debugging tools. There might not be monitoring tools. Right now, for example, like if you want to put serverless into production, there are only three, two ways probably. One is AWS Lambda, otherwise I have to go Azure Functions. Right, there is no other way by which I can take these and deploy. So though the Kennedy platform is still under development, it's not completely done. So we cannot rely on that for the production deployments. Right? And then again, um, that's what I mean by vendor locking there. So you have to stick to one of the vendors, probably end of the day, so you cannot use different vendors for different things. Okay, so um, before we go further, so what I'd love to show you is like a quick demo. Uh, let me try to see. Okay, this is, I have my application. Is that visible or you want me to? Increase that. Is this okay? So I have a I have one uh, VM. It's all-in-one OpenShift instance running in Google Cloud. Um, this is my OpenShift application console. How many of you know about OpenShift? Few minutes. I don't want the red hatters out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So two guys. Okay. Uh, so OpenShift is nothing but your enterprise Kubernetes. So if you so the enterprise Kubernetes platform that can be deployed within your enterprises. Uh, so because you can take Kubernetes, I can take Kubernetes and run it on, on premises, but in case if you are stuck with an enterprise which is not an IT shop, then you might need to, you might don't know how to crack the bugs, how to fix the bugs and how to rerun this. That's where OpenShift comes in picture. So it's kind of an open source enterprise Kubernetes you can take and then it has packed a lot of enterprise features. And as you know that we are the biggest contributors back to upstream Kubernetes. So we are also leading 15 out of 21 SIGs that's part of the Kubernetes uh, group as well. And then we do a lot of other things around Kubernetes. So you can trust this platform. So this is a platform that you can take your application and deploy it in production, right? Um, so this uh, nothing but I'm going to run all Kubernetes kubectl commands. If you're aware of Kubernetes, it's all going to be kubectl commands that I'm going to run, but it's going to get executed on OpenShift, which means that it's still the underlying platform 
is Kubernetes for you. So whatever you can do in Kubernetes, you can do with OpenShift as well. All right. So uh, let me quickly jump to the uh, the applications. Uh, I might need to blow this up as well. Is it okay or clear? Or you want me to? Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Hopefully my screen is big enough to hold this. Right. So the first one I'm just going to do a very simple uh, deployment of a service. So let me quickly open uh, this file for you as well. So this is not the one. Uh, I might need to go to yes, this one. Right, so, so I have a uh, Node application. So no, uh, no big code inside this Node app. It's just a typical hello world. We just one have one service to JSON saying hello to you, right? So uh, the first thing you have to notice uh, about Knative is that Knative uses Kubernetes primitives which means that if you are aware of how do I write my deployment YAMLs, how do I write my service YAMLs, how do I write any other YAMLs that is part of Kubernetes resource definition, this is, you are going to follow the same steps here as well, but only thing is that the YAML structure is going to change, right? For example, here in this case, uh, Knative has defined a serving uh, dot Knative dot dev. If people are not aware of what this is, this is called a CRDs in Kubernetes, custom resource definitions wherein I can define my own controllers, own definitions, own resources within Kubernetes kind of pluggable so that and then it gets creates the necessary resources that is required for you, right? So this is a little bit beyond this particular session, but just remember that these are custom APIs. They are called as CRDs in, 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 in Kubernetes world, right? If you go to my blog links, which I said there, I have a link which can take you to CRD if you want to read more about CRDs, uh, but just imagine that these are custom definitions, right? Pluggable APIs and I have a, Something called as a service. This is different from Kubernetes service. Uh, so this is called a service. This again a service, and then I have give a name for the service. And what I'm going to do is like I have something called as run latest as a spec, which means that in, at any given point of time, this is going to run you the latest version of the application revision. I'll tell you what is the latest revision in a second. So and then it has a template, and then it's typically like how do you define your uh, what do you call it? a pod template within a deployment? If you know your pod template within a deployment. Within this, it's nothing new for you as well. All right. So let me uh, take uh, the. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is this configuration specific to OpenShift or it works with uh, you know, any other platform? No, it's nothing to OpenShift. So this is, in fact, it can run even in a normal Kub Kubernetes as well. So if time permits, I'll tell you how we can create a quickly your Kubernetes cluster within GKE. If you have access to Google Cloud, I can show you because that's the most easiest way I ever seen this. So th I'm uh, taking a simple example rather than the previous one because this is much simpler and cleaner. So if you see this, I have I have a service, I have a name. I say always run my latest revision because uh, Knative follows the 12 factor way of creating applications, which means that any change to your configuration is going to spin up a new version. I'll, I'll also tell you uh, that I'll also show you that during my demo. For example, I have an env called as message prefix thing hello. In case I'm going to change this to something else. Then it's going to change. I'll change this when, once I deploy this application. I'm going to change the environment variable to from hello to hi. Right? You'll see that a new revision will be deployed within Knative, and then it will always say from the latest revision. Right? And if you have time, the last part of demo, I also have a distribution. Right? Where I can split for new revision 10%, old revision 20%. I can also jumble between those revisions as well. So I'll come back to that a bit later. So now imagine that run latest says that always run the latest revision. Revision in sense, it's a revision like how you have in a git commit, right? I have a tag, I have a branch. If it's going to be a tag, then I cannot edit it back. If it's going to be a revision, I mean if it's going to be a branch, then I can go push things into branch, right? This is similar to a uh, thing in revision is that sim revision is similar to your git tag. Once I commit and push it, I cannot change it, right? And the history is maintained uh, infinitely within Knative. So that at any given point of time, I can go to the revision where I want. So let's say I had to deploy revision V1 and V2 into production, and I found that revision V2 has some issues, right? I have to roll back something, right? That's what 12 factor says that at any given point of time, I have to low, go back to a last known good configuration, right? That's why revision does that. So that if revision is mutable, then I cannot go back, right? Somebody will sneak in and then change the code or do something, right? I cannot go back to the exactly the same thing which is which is running perfectly before. Right? That was the whole idea, the 12-factor way that I'm, I'm going to do this. 
run latest, run the latest revision of this, all right. So the, I do not want to jump into the code, the code does not have anything big here, it is just a hello world uh, thing, it is just going to say hello node.js or something. So how do I run this? So uh, I am going to go to this serving blocks, this is what the uh, YAML I showed you. Um, I say kubectl, I say I am going to use kubectl only here, so kubectl dash f with the file. I say service dot, um, what I mean while I do is like I just, uh, do not worry about what I do in k here. K is nothing but my alias for kubectl, a bit lazy typing the uh, commands, okay. So I just made it, uh, so now I am going to say kubectl dash f, oh sorry. Kubectl dash apply dash f. So I am just going to apply the service YAML. The moment I do this, you will see this uh, pods getting created for us. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. You see this created deployment getting created. I am also seeing that here. Right. The pod is getting initialized. Uh, if people know about Istio, how many of you know about Istio? Service mesh. Okay. So this is backed by Istio. I am not going to get into that. Just imagine that there is a service mesh which runs behind the scenes. That is the reason why you see 3 of 3 pods here instead of 1 of 1 usually which is the one which you have seen here because there are 2 more pods which is getting deployed behind the scenes that is for K native infrastructure. So you do not need to worry about what it actually does. There is going to be only one pod which is going to take care of your application, right. Let me show that in uh, the console. I will just stop this so that it does not do this. So if I get on to this pod, so we will have 3 containers. There is one init container which is an Istio init container. So do not worry about that. So this is an Istio stuff for you. If people are not known to Istio, I think uh, we can just get on to our divination live. So we had a Istio session earlier on as well. So you can just go and see what Istio does. This user container is, is your app container. So where your app is deployed. For example, in this case, it's going to be a Node.js app, which is deployed here. And this is Kube proxy. This Kube proxy is again is internally used by Knative. So to kind of delegate the request into this particular pod, right? Because it's going to be serverless, I keep getting requests to come up and down, all right. The first thing what you are going to do right now, so we saw this, so I said like you will go back to this, just imagine this console is just like instead of me typing the command there and just have this console here. You see this the revision right now is greater four, four zeros followed by one, this is the first revision of your thing. So how do I know the revisions? So what you can do is like uh, k get revisions, sorry. Or EDI. So uh, since I said it's going to be CRD, so the first thing is the uh, the resource name, the followed by serving dot native dot dev, which is the API how CRD defines, right? That's a unique name that CRD gives for you. So when I said k get revisions dot serving dot native dot dev, it's going to give you what revisions you have now. It might take temp temporarily a few minutes because I have to go to my cloud. So we just have greater to follow four zeros followed by one. That's the first one, right? So how do I invoke that? So to invoke this, what what we need to do is like so. Uh, so if you let's go to the uh, in Knative, once you deploy Knative, we have few namespaces created by Knative, Knative build, Knative eventing, and Knative serving. So these are the three different namespaces that gets created for three different components, which we'll see. Right now we just saw only serving. So what happens is once you go to serving. You will see a bunch of three other components there. These are the internal Knative components that is created by things deployed. And then let us go to Istio system, which is deployed here. <laughs> so we will see a um, Knative ingress gateway. This is how your request comes inside Kubernetes, right, to, to a Knative pod. I cannot directly call that. I have to go through this Knative ingress gateway. So then, then only I can go and invoke the pod, all right. So what to fun, what we will do is right now, so I will just go to start a watch get pods, uh, OC, okay, I will keep watching this, I am just going to make it aged, now it is 3 minutes, by default it is 5 minutes plus for it the pods to automatically come down until it does not get any request. So what I am going to do right now is I am just going to keep it running so that you will see the pod getting terminated automatically. But before that let us give a call, uh, it is going to be curl, so this is a command. Um, 32380 uh, is my node port, 
uh, inside my service, Ingress Gateway service. I don't have a load balancer or a domain name attached. So what I'm kind of, I'm mimicking the domain name, for example, greeter.myproject.example.com. That's a service name that gets automatically created when you deploy a service. And obviously, uh, the example.com is kind of configurable. I can change, if you, are on a, if you are in real infrastructure, I can say, okay, I want to have something like uh, redhat.com, then I can go change that to redhat.com as well. So for now, it's by default, it's example.com. The name goes like the service name, the namespace name, followed by your domain suffix. Right, so that you can have a wildcard pattern inside your DNS server so that the request comes inside this automatically. Right? And if and H, I'm just kind of sending this header so that my request goes through. This is what I did. And then I got alone node.js given to you, right? Right now. All right. So now what I'm going to do is, as I said earlier, so I'm just going to change this service to say hi instead of hello. I'm changing the value, which means that my environment value has changed. Technically, as per 12 factor, what I have supposed to do is like this needs to have a redeployment done, right? So what I'm going to do, go ahead and then let me stop this for a second. And then k apply dash f. You see the service is configured. And then now if you go back to my project here, you'll have the next revision automatically deployed for you, right? So this revision, let's keep watching this, is get automatically died in a few minutes. Okay, because by default, I have one more demo where I'll show you how to change the value. By default, it's five minutes, right? And this one is up. Since we are given run latest, so what happens, I'm going to fire the same request again. Okay, I've not changed anything here. So the previous one was hello, Node.js for you. Now when I say this, this is hi, Node.js for you. Right, it's not going to the old service. The old service is still running. Okay, so let's, let's try to see if the service is still running. Um, watch pods. All right, the, both of them are running. But what I've said in my configuration when I deployed my service in the Knative configuration, I said that do latest, which means that run the latest revision of the code, which is 002, 0002. That's the reason why you get the response back as hi instead of hello. The previous one was hello, after that it was hi. All right? Cool. So I wanted to die before I can give the next demo um, where it's going to do this uh, separate stuff. Also going to do is like in the last part of the demo, I'm also going to show you like how we can, right now I deployed as a single service. Instead of that, I can deploy configuration separately, service separately, right? route separately in fact, not service. Right? And then I can kind of make it link and work together where we can do the distribution. So I allow it to die. After that, like I will kind of show you, uh, so which means that I have to leave it for some time without any request, nothing happening to this. By the time it does that, then it, it automatically dies. Okay. While it does, what I'm going to show you is like I'm just going to show you the other stuff which you have so that we can walk through some of the slides while it dies and then I'll show you an example how we can reconfigure that so that it, it can also do auto scaling automatically it scales to any number of requests and then come down automatically all right uh, sorry yes it's called that's what I'm going to do next because I want the other pods to die so that you really know the difference right otherwise you'll not know the difference actually so these are again for offline read so what I'm going to do right now is jump to the three building blocks I was talking about are giving you serving. Uh, the serving, imagine, is typically like your service, Kubernetes service, plus deployment, club together, right? The biggest advantage in this is that whenever I have to bring down my Kubernetes service, I have to use the replica account, scale down to replica zero or something like that to bring down replicas. But the advantage with serving in Knative is that scale down to zero happens automatically. If you see the block on the top, I execute some code right now. It's scaled down to zero, you'll see that in a few seconds. And then whenever I, I give the request back, it scales up to one. And then it goes to zero. Not necessarily to be one, it could be anything because when I, by default the concurrency is 100, it can handle 100 requests, one pod can handle 100 requests. So if I reduce it down, it automatically scales to number of pods to satisfy the, that many number of requests. I'm going to mimic that soon. So imagine that it can go up and down automatically for you. All right? <coughs> I also have another one, uh, another building block which is called as build. Uh, so what basically it means that if you, uh, you remember that you have a Jenkins job, just imagine the scenario. I have a Jenkins job. I push some code into my GitHub and then automatically the build starts and then it keeps running. Make the jar or container and deploy that and then your application is going to use a container, right? That's the usual thing with Kubernetes as of day. So what we do with build, the same thing right now, but it cannot automatically pull the build for us. There is a pipeline spec specification which is getting run right now, done right now, which can do that. If you see this picture, so what I'm trying to do, I'm creating a build, 
Okay, build has a template. I'll come back to that in a second. I'll show you a code. Template means that it's kind of a reusable components, and then it defines some parameters like how your workspace, Jenkins job has some parameters. Similar to that, build has some parameters, and it has some steps. For example, I need to check out the code, do a build, push the image into the container, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Into registry. I'm sorry. And that's what it does. For example, I can define a build which is kind of uh, inferred from this, refers to a build template. And a build is created, the build is going to pull the resource and it's going to execute step by step. Each step by step that you see here, right there. I'm, I'm sorry, does it come here? No? Okay. Yeah, good. As of now, not because the pipelines are still being developed. So, right now, what the problem, what happens is I'll tell you, come back to the problem is once I st the build has some errors. I have to delete the build again to start it again. Uh, the pipelines resolves that. I can task a specific task, but it's still getting matured, so I don't have a pipeline demo with me right now. So here I just do a build. Then a Maven build, I'm just going to show you the build as I'll explain it again. Just remember that step one, step two, step three gets executed. Where it infers the steps is from the build templates. It knows which steps needs to be executed. Right now what happens is for each of these steps, I will have one init container created, right? So which runs the actual code. And then it pushes the images to the container registry. And then what happens, whichever service is going to refer to this build, that's going to receive a trigger. And then it starts deploying the service automatically for you. Right? I'm going to deploy a Java service, not a similar Java service, you know, hello world kind of stuff. But everything is going to be done via this uh, mechanism. Right? So let's do that before I jump to the next part of this. So while this, uh, let's see if this is done. Okay, so that only the two, it's getting terminated right now because his age is five minutes. It crosses age five minutes, now everything is done, right? So now what happens, you see right now we had two deployments, if you remember, service revision one and revision two, right? Now when I scale my service, what happens is that only the latest gets scaled, it will not scale the older one, right? So that's what I'm going to show you right now. So I have a script, what I'm going to do is like, in this script, what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to bring down the concurrency to 30, so by default, as I said that 100 requests can be served by a Knative service. I'm just going to bring it to 30, which means that if I fire 100 requests, I will have at least four pods serving the request for me, right? Four deployments technically, right? And then I'm also making this scale threshold to one minute, which means that after one minute, my it's just going to watch for the request to come in. If no requests come for next 30 seconds, it's going to scale down your deployments. Okay, this is what I mean. So scale to zero threshold, and scale to zero grace period, these are the two parameters which you have to change. The threshold means that what is the time when is under which as the comment says that it will wait for that many number of minutes, right? Until no request is received, it is scaled on automatically, right? For a moment, like what happens once it reaches one minute, it will also have a grace period of 30 seconds, which means that it will suppose at the 99th or 59th second you are firing a request, right? It let's say it takes uh, for, for 10 more seconds to complete, then it will not shut down at one minute, it will wait for next 30 seconds more before it gets shut off. That's a grace period that it gives you, right? Uh, so if there is a request that is probably in progress in the 59 second, all right? Uh, so it has to finish in the next 30 Absolutely, seconds. absolutely. So that's, that's, that's right, that's right, right? So uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. So uh, I have a script which actually does this. It's just a kubectl altering a config map. For example, I'll show you the config map as well. So if you go to the Knative uh, serving namespace, um, Config maps. These are the advantage you see with OpenShift because if you run with the raw Kubernetes, to go and see all these stuff except GKE, it's not possible. But in, in OpenShift, it'll get you all those resources that you can edit online, live, right? So that's what we mean here. So if you see this, the concurrency target, this is here, by default, it's 100, right? And then if you see this, uh, scale to threshold is five minutes, scale to grace period is two minutes, right? So this is what I'm going to change right now. This is a default one. So what I'm going to do right now is I just run this script configure scaling.sh. Right, if you see this, this is getting changed to 30 now. And then you'll see this to 30 seconds, and this is to one minute, right? Now, technically, what happens when I'm going to scale? I have a scaling here. I've done a scale script. If people are not aware of this, so Siege uh, is a tool that can be used to do concurrency testing with Kubernetes, right? So Siege is a tool that can be used to run Kubernetes concurrency test. So for example, if you see here, what I'm trying to do is like, I'm just going to do one repetition, that's what R means, right? And then I have a concurrency level of 100, which means that I'm going to pump in 100 requests, 
and I'm going to go to the same curl URL which you saw earlier, right? If you, have, if you have a domain name, then you can give the complete domain name, but I'm going to use the same URL again. So let's run this and we are watching the pods on the right side. Just watch that. So it's now starting to serve. Now what happens is that your pod gets up automatically. Now you see this, I got four right now, which is getting automatically for you. And then it's going to go up and then everything is going to serve your request, all the four, and I'll wait for one minute you see it's automatically coming down, right? So since this is what auto scaling is, because right now I configured this, it has to serve all the requests, all the 100 requests. So I can have only concurrency of 30, which means that I should have four pods deployed, four deployments done, so that they can serve 30, 30, 30 yeah. on four, right? Maximum 120 requests can be served. And then that's the reason why it scaled up to four deployments. And then it served the request now. And then if you watch this, I have, I'm right now in 36 seconds, maybe, I have a liberty that I can wait for it to terminate for some time, right? So while it terminates, probably you can, I can take some questions as well so that you can see that terminating on live, right? So any questions? No, it has, it shall, should have Kubernetes platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do it outside OpenShift. I said, right, I'm not, if you see that I've not done any OpenShift command here, right? I've done anything, all kubectl commands, right? I've not done any OpenShift commands, right? OpenShift I'm using because I get a nice console, enterprise ready Kubernetes for you, which can be used for your deployment. <laughs> Other than that, it's all Kubernetes. It's nothing no, new to this, right? So if you are not an IT shop, tell me that, will you be okay to take a Kubernetes, let's say 1.12 and run, run into some issues, and will you be concentrating on your business or will you be concentrating on your fixing Kubernetes bugs? That's not your job, right? If I'm going to be a guy like who is going to take care of my business, then I'm not going to worry about what Kubernetes, I'll buy something from Red Hat or IBM or Microsoft or somebody else, right? And then I guide, I use, start using them, right? So if you see this, now it's one minute up, so all these pods are getting terminated and they are gone, right? If you see, technically if you count after one minute, it'll be 30 seconds more because it gives you the grace period of 30 seconds before it actually kills it, right? So for a fun, what you'll also do is like, let's, let's change this to, uh, say, technically I would say I can bring down to 20, for example. So which means that I should have five deployments, correct? And then I'm going to configure this again. Now when I say siege hundred now, I should have five deployments created right now for me. That's what it does, right? So it's, it's in fact, this is Node application, um, uh, but even in Java also, you see that it's, it's not that slow, comparatively both Nava, Nava and Node.js, both of them runs in pretty much, but still you know that enterprise Java apps tend to be a bit slower. Uh, considering the thing. So now we have all the deployments doing their job for you. And again, so why you use OpenShift? It's all because you can go here. I can see this stuff here, right? This kind of console, this kind of pods app, I can scale up and scale down here. I can go this deployments, I can go and watch the configuration deployments here. I can watch the configuration, I can watch the environments, I can watch the events. I can change anything on the on the console, right? If I'm not a very good Kubernetes CLI user, then this is what is going to be there, right? And if you imagine that Kubernetes uh, earlier did not have the user thing, for example, for RBACs, but latest Kubernetes versions have RBACs for users, which was the one which was contributed from OpenShift upstream to Kubernetes, right? So we do that back to Kubernetes, so it means that, so we are doing a lot of things around Kubernetes, so we have much, much more expertise around Kubernetes than anybody else in the world because we are the, we are the top contributors there, upstream contributors. Yeah. Where do you see the time of this thing and so forth? Do you know the model to do How it knows that it's terminating? That is, that is what I mentioned by CRD, custom resource definitions. So what happens is that, uh, let's say this custom resource definition, let's, I'll come back to that in a second. I'll, you, you saw this, right? Yeah. This is in a serving namespace. Right, so what happens, right, if you go to a serving, <coughs> Kennedy serving namespace, so we have all these pods deployed, activator, autoscaler, controller, and webhook, right? So the webhook is something which kinds of looks for the permissions, whether I can go and alter something dynamically, right? By, uh, by default, all the objects within Kubernetes are immutable, right? If you want to immute it, then I have to enable the admission controller, which is done by this webhook. Right, which, is, which is by default enabled in this deployment. So you have to do that enable when you deploy Knative. And then what this controller will do is the controller will look for these objects, resources being deployed. When I say k apply this particular service.yaml, so this controller is configured to look for this particular serving. 
Once it has seen this, it reconciles your objects. And if the object is not there, it deploys your new deployment for you. So that's what the permission we are given to, to do a new deployment. By default, you cannot do this. You have to enable that. That's the admission controller webhook. And OpenShift, uh, as of 3.11, which I'm using, I have to do it manually. The next OpenShift version onwards, it's automatically enabled because that API has been promoted to from, from beta to actually live. Okay. So that's what it does. So that's how it knows. And even you can write your own controller. That's what the CRDs are powerful about. Because if you want to write any custom functionality within Kubernetes, you don't need to go touch any of the Kubernetes core sources. Instead, you write CRDs and deploy CRDs. For example, if you heard of a serverless framework called as Kubeless, Kubeless uses CRDs. Okay, it uses CRDs to deploy your functions. It writes the CRDs, and then once it sees functions, it deploys the functions, right? So that's what everybody relies on. So that's what even uh, Kubernetes has relied on. Uh, I think, and then if you also see every, for example, even build. Build also does the same thing. It has a build control and build webhook. So when I say something build that I'll show that build in a second, it does the same thing. Same thing with eventing as well. So eventing also does, I don't have a demo today for eventing, but eventing I can do with Kafka channel, channel source. It's a little bit complicated. I want to avoid this today. More than that, I don't have a demo running right now. So, right, so. No. So eventing is eventing is just like your source. I'll come back to that. I have a diagram which explains that. All right. So right now, if we go back to our namespace, my project where I'm deploying my all my apps, everything is <coughs> dead right now. Okay. So I'm uh, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to clean up everything. So key okay, delete. Okay. One minute. Let me see which project I'm in. Because it's a more it's a more dangerous command like your root, okay. You have to be very careful. Don't use this, please. And otherwise, use it. But you know which project you are in, because I remember multiple times there is a default project which OpenShift creates, and OpenShift has all these infrastructure components. <laughs> so I accidentally went. I was trying some demo, and then I was completing the steps up, and then I went and executed the command. Boom, gone. I have to run my Ansible scripts again to get it deployed. Okay, so just be careful about it. So I'm just clear it off because I can show you. Uh, what the next one is, all right? So let me get back to my slides. Am I on time or? I think I have two more demos to go. <coughs> not bad. I have 22 minutes. I think I'm doing good. Hope my face is not so fast. But there, there might be something which is which you don't understand. But when you go back and read the blogs and then my my repositories, you should be able to recollect it. Because first time everything looks Greek and, Greek and Latin too. We saw the demo. I think we need to see the build demo, right? Okay, let's see that. So uh, let me go to my thing again. So I'm going to do a Java app deployment right now. So I have something called as a build. So just for the sake of uh, faster builds, what I've done is that I did a, a persistent volume creation so that my PVC is there so that I can cache all my Maven artifacts inside that so that my build is faster. Okay. That's what I did. Let me check if I have done that. K get PVC. All right, I have a PVC. The <coughs> good thing about this again is, um, again, this is another OpenShift feature. So when I'm on Google Cloud, right, when I create a PVC, then automatically it, it binds you to the Google Persistent Disk. When I'm on AWS, it binds you to the AWS EBS volumes. When I'm on Azure, it can create an Azure disk. And that are, those are done automatically by OpenShift when you deploy. So when you specify which cloud you're going to deploy, right now these are the three major clouds which is deployed, uh, supported. Once you say which cloud you're going to deploy, then it automatically creates these configurations for you so that you don't need to do this. In fact, it goes one level up. In fact, in this case, uh, I just have only single node where everything is deployed. If you have a multiple distribution, then it also creates a load balancer also for you. So you don't need to worry about that as well. So those are something which is automatically read to your environment. It's configurable. It's, there's are Ansible properties. I can configure those properties to make it work, right? So I, I got a PVC here. So uh, let me get uh, k get uh, build templates. Let me see if I have a build templates create. I think I created some. Okay, I don't have a build template because I cleared everything out. All right. So let's first see what the build template look like. Okay, so this is PVC, just for storing my Maven artifacts, nothing more than that. Uh, I have to go to the templates and Java 
How many of you know about Builda? Uh, no, no, no red adders. So, uh, non red adders. How many of you know that something called as there is something called as Builda? So, Builda is the uh, tool. I could say as a tool. Okay, let me get Builda. So, this is a tool which can build. Uh, I, I can go into the other. I can go to this one. Uh, which is your IO project it can take you to the uh, so people have know that I can do a, a build I need a docker daemon to, to create a container right container image yeah. so with builder what you don't need a docker container okay so it's just like that I can take an existing container mount it as a Linux file system and then copy the files like you how you use your normal Linux commands and repackage it and push it to your repository so this is this is what builder does and builder in fact, is the only thing is that builder runs only on Linux because obviously I have I'm going to create one Linux containers. I cannot run it on Windows. I cannot run it on Mac OS, and I have to run it only on Linux system. So it basically creates. You can go read about more about builder here on this site builder.io. I think the links are provided in my blogs as well as in my slides. So for example, I'll show you what my script looks like. Right? Okay, before I get down to this uh, builder.sh. So I just have a uh, Java. Okay, if you see this, uh, bash, right? Nothing more than this. there's no Docker commands here, right? It's all typical Linux commands. I have a bash. First thing, I just assigning, a, I'm mounting the container builder from whichever container you want to mount from. I'm saying mount from distroless Java. Distroless Java is a very minimalistic image that can run your Java apps. Okay, and once I do this, and then I'm mounting this folder Java container, which which becomes that it becomes a folder for me, mounted point. And then I'm going to make a DAR. If you see the make DAR, I'm doing it on a mount folder, which means that it creates a deployment folder inside this. And then I'm copying everything from my app workspace. I'll come back to this workspace in a second. Imagine that this is similar to your build DAR of your Jenkins. <coughs> from there, what I'm trying to do is like which context DAR? Because if you have a multi-module Java project, then I'll have multiple contexts. Target, and then I have a jar name, copying it back to my mount directory deployment jar name, right? This is what I've created there, right? I'm just doing a Typical Linux copy, making it executable, okay, and then giving some working DAR and other stuff which you typically do in a Docker file, right? And then I'm creating an image by by virtue of builder commit container image name, whatever image name you want, fully qualified image name, right, with your registry and every stuff. Once I do this, I'm pushing it back to my uh, Docker registry, right? The OpenShift gives you, or Kubernetes even uh, single node Kubernetes by default gives you a registry. I'm pushing it back to the same registry, the image which I have created, right? There is no Docker file here. Simple Linux commands, copy paste. So if you want to create containers, this is the most easiest way I have seen, right? Get into a Linux box, have a Linux VM, start doing this, right? So this is what I've done here. So I've created a template which kind of says Java builder. So so that I just imagine this, and I have a bunch of parameters. For example, app builder name, which app builder name. In this case, I'm using Maven. So I'm just giving the Maven builder name. There are multiple. So if, if people are not aware, uh, just search cloud builders. There are a lot of builders available from uh, Google Cloud, so which is used to build a Node application, Go application, Java application, any kind of application, right? So from that's where I'm taking that, and then I'm giving a jar file name which I need to give. That's what I'm using there. So if you see this, this builder image is what I use there. This Java name is what the variable I'm using here, right? So all these variables are the environment variables which get pushed inside your uh, script, right? It's available for the script. All these parameters are available for your script as environment variables as well. And then I'm saying that this is my builder uh, container, which builds my builder image. So that's what I'm using. This is my custom image. Uh, and then what's the image name I need to give, which context here, as I said. And caching, as I said, I'm mounting a PB, uh, so that I need to give a, which cache volume I need to use for this, all right? And which script I need to execute? I just use builder.sh. It could be anything you want, right? That gets automatically executed. If you see this first step, as I said, build has multiple steps. That's what steps means, right? The first step I'm saying, Java builder image, I'm just giving which is Maven. I'm just passing the Maven task, right? Clean package. This is a username where the .m2 folder gets created automatically. And then working DAR, this is what the works by default. Uh, your Knative build mounts a volume called a slash workspace. So where all the build artifacts are stored, right? When you check out your code, your code is there in slash workspace, like your 
build year of your Jenkins job, right? It's quite similar to that. And then I'm giving a mount volumes. If you see, I'll come back to this. Just remember this M2 cache name. I'm just mounting the uh, M2 directory so that my build artifacts are cached so that it's faster, quicker. And then finally, I do the third step. What I uh, the third step? What I'm after building the app. The second step I do is like push this app into my registry, right? I execute this container and build image. I'm just passing all these parameters which will be needed inside my build script, all right? Once it is done. Uh, for now, I just use an empty DR volume. Let's go back to my service here, service Java. I said from where I need to check out the source. I'm using a service account here. Obviously, you need a service account in case you want to pass secrets. For example, if you are using a private repository, then you want to pass a secret, then it uses a service account. So by default here, that it's all public repository. But still, I use a uh, service account here because OpenShift has some restrictions not anybody can push image into registry. So the, the guy, the account, service account should have permissions to push it into registry. This is not available in raw Kubernetes again. If you're deploying raw Kubernetes, I can push, anybody can push to the default registry, right? So this is something which OpenShift gives you on a lot of things on restrictions, which you call SCCs, security context. So that is what OpenShift brings as an enterprise feature again for you, right? And then I'm giving an image name, obviously. And then I'm just saying which context DR, for example, I have two directories here. I say go to part one into Java, right? When I check the code, it checks this particular code. Something like how we typically do in Jenkins, right? Jenkins also I give a context DR, right? Which from where I need to start running the build. I do the exactly the same thing here. And then I have the cache directory. I map it to the PV volume, right? If you see here, there's a PV volume which gets, uh, okay, get PVC, right? M2 cache is a PV volume that got mapped to this. And don't worry about this annotation. This is just internal OpenShift. Stuff and then I'm using this Docker registry, blah blah blah. This particular image, right, which is where we push the image back, right? So this does end to end, right? I have to only code, push it to my GitHub repository, and then the image starts getting built once I start the build, and then the image gets pushed, service gets deployed automatically, right? So right now, as you saw earlier, so we're still watching this folder. I don't have anything right now, right? So what I'm going to do right now is uh, Okay, uh, okay, I'll get back to this. This is the one which I need. Let's say, okay, get pods for convenience. Uh, I'll go to cd dot dot uh, serving blocks part two uh, build templates, right? First thing I have to do is I have to create a template, all right? Let's do that first. Okay, apply dash f uh, template, okay? This Java template, I have one more for Node as well, if you are interested in Node. So the template gets created for you. So let's see how we know this. Uh, the one of the advantages of CRD is that the moment you deploy the CRDs, I can look up like any of the get pods or get resources or get services for even for your thing, for your, uh, what do you call, CRDs, I'm sorry. So build templates is what I deployed. When I say build templates, right now I get the KNA build template for me, Java builder. This is ready for me. All right, so now it's time that I go back out uh, and then one more level up. I just see LS, I just go to Java and say that I'm going to do a Java deployment and then say k apply dash f service dot yaml. Uh, oh my god, I'm sorry, I need to go one level up. cd dot dot k apply dash f service. Oh, what is that? Part two, uh, no services. Okay, I need to go to uh, build, right? I'm sorry, I was in a different directory, but don't worry, all are same. I need to go to the build blocks, uh, can native build blocks part one, right? Yeah, that I have. So don't worry about the templates. Templates are both on both these things. So it's exactly the same order deployed. I say k apply dash f, right? Service Java dot yaml. The moment I see, you see this, there's four init containers that get created. Okay, how do I watch? I'll introduce you to a new tool, Kale, Kubernetes tail, pod, and I give the pod name. And it takes some time for it to refresh, start reading this. 
So you see this git source getting cloned. That's the build step dash git source. That's the first step that's getting executed. So you'll see this. It is one. I think you'll see this build containers changing up for you. And then now it starts to do the mounting of volumes and then start to do your build as well, right? Hopefully, I think we have changed the uh, native thing. I hope it gets completed within one minute. Otherwise, I have to go change this again, right? So you see this ma'am, uh, Maven build being done for you. So this is, if you see this build step, build app, that's what you see, right? The other way to see this is pretty easy. Uh, let's go here, uh, k get pods, I will not want to so what's the other way you see? Uh, it's like, let me copy this. I can say, uh, kale is one way, it's easiest way. Cube cuttle, k logs, dash dash, greeter, dash c, which is a container name, okay. This is the other way to see it. Right, so I have to give a pod name dash c the container name. Right, rather than that, you can use kale. Kale has a lot of options as well. I can go to deployment. I can check the deployment. I can do anything what I want. For example, if you see this, the the build has been completed right now. Okay, so I'm just waiting for the pod to be initialized. Come on. I was happy that my demos were working today morning. So let me see what happened here. Was the build failed for some reason? Uh, is there any build failure? Okay. It's good that something happened and something was completed, but it's not went to the other state. Okay, get pods. Okay, let's delete it again. So that's what I said. Said so right now, if we have to delete, um, I don't have any other way. I have to delete the service and come back again. That's the limitation right now. So I just say k delete dash f uh, service java dot yaml so that you'll see this uh, k get pods dash w so you can have any pods right now I'll just go k apply dash f service java yaml I have this created and uh, k I'll see what's the problem this debugging is a little bit difficult with this kind of thing. <laughs> I think they are doing away with the init containers soon, so it should be much easier in the next release of the spec, where it's going to be much easier for you to find out and read this, right? So uh, let me see, is there any network latency or something? I don't know what happened. Why, after successful completion, I did not see that image getting in. Yeah, that's what I think it should create a container automatically for you. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why the container was not created the build app is being done right here it's, it's copying the blob it's downloading the image and then copying the blob storing the signatures it's supposed to push now right, it's committing the java image and then storing signatures and then copying the blob i think build up push is happening here uh, let me see what happens here it's supposed to push is supposed to get happen and done. Um, let me see k get events ah, successfully pushed. The moment is pushed, I think you'll see this uh, thing happening right now. The build is completed. Uh, okay. Creator resource has failed. I think I don't know what's the reason. Let's find out what's the reason for that. Uh, k get KSVC. KSVC is a Kubernetes service. I think it say it say failed. Revision is missing. Um, K get pods. Uh, okay. Describe KSVC greeter. Okay. Got uh, Docker registry. Oh my God. I'm sorry. It's my mistake. Uh, it's signed by unknown authority doctor dot registry certificate dot com. I think it should go ahead with the HTTPS. I don't know why suddenly it's failing. So that's the reason if you see that I had an annotation here. 
image policy just to say that it resolves every name so that it doesn't fail the image policy right uh, maybe i would have missed some steps from my thing okay um, let's go into my github where i have everything here this is the build blocks where i went in there probably i might have missed adding this docker registry to the i need to add this to the knative by default has a set of registries so in this case i'm using an internal registry so i have to go tell knative that ignore this registry for any tls checks right that is something which i have to tell otherwise it will always check for tls that's what has happened in our case as well so what i'm going to do is like it's good that it happened so i have to go skip this registry so uh, let's first get this uh, yaml and see what happened here right so this is config controller let's go to console uh, go to our kennedy serving uh, config maps config controller and uh, we have this so i don't have the registry added here you see so because of this what's happened is that i have to make this registry again so i have to add the so by default what happens in so if you have the fully qualified name right for example docker.io slash something slash jboss slash jboss eap right so you have the fully qualified name knative expects the fully qualified name for every of your service right and since we are doing a local development uh, you cannot have the complete registry name you'll keep pushing everything and then that's the reason why by default ko.local and dev.local has been excluded so anything you say dev.local slash greeter for example right then that image will not be checked for TLS checks, right? And also it uses SHA algorithms, Q if you see this image. So it's not the latest or not the tag, it uses the SHA, so which is more secured. So that's the reason why it is always supports only V2 versions of the Docker registry, right? All right, so let's do this. So how do I do that? So I have the commands again on my blog, I mean on my GitHub repo. So I'm just going to edit this, okay? Um, so let's go back here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply this again. So if you see this now, I'm doing an OC apply. So as I said earlier, I'm using kubectl and OC. OC is OpenShift client interchangeably, right? OpenShift client has Kubernetes, everything related to Kubernetes plus OpenShift specific objects. All right, I applied this now. So let's go back to my uh, console to see what happens to this. Now I have my Docker registry added here. Right, the Docker registry, the default or SVC added here, so that my TLS checks will not be done right now. All right, so so how do we go back again? So let's go back again uh, to my project. All right, and then I say I have to obviously delete this. I'm sorry about that. Okay, delete. Okay, get pods again. And k apply the chef service dot java dot yaml. All right, so you'll see that getting created. Uh, let's see what happens now. K dash dash pod. Short p is a uh, short form of that, but all right. So, so you got the problem right now. So I don't, I did not do the TLS checks. So because of that, the image was not pushed uh, into my because it has a custom generated certificates so it ignores openshift does not allow you to do this that's what has happened right now i'm doing the build again so as i said uh, as a recap so we have to kind of do a delete and create the build again right now because of the for the current spec the, if you use a pipeline then you can stop and start a task there will be multiple tasks i can stop and task a specific task so that it runs again like how you do in a jenkins pipeline right but pipeline builds are not uh, really matured enough so i did not have a pipeline a demo maybe next time i could do that let's see if the blob is getting pushed properly this time i hope it does it's copying the blob uh, let's see if this is getting pushed push 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 all right successfully pushed and you see the deployment getting created for you right so this time we are through so it's the same app uh, Everything is same. Uh, I'm just going to do curl, same curl command. For convenience, I had everything as greeter, so it's easier. So that's the reason why I have to delete the older one. Now you should guess Java, right? So it says Java. That's where we had deployed the app from. Now we did from end to end, right? From end to end build to deployment. All right. 
let me do a time check of how much time I have. I just have 10 seconds maybe. All right, so, um, so would you mind me doing one more demo or we are good? Maybe I need it, it's one hour probably, close to one hour. Or Yeah, I can ask a questions. Probably I can stop with my demo as of now. I have one more demo to show you, but maybe that will take a few more minutes. So I just want to respect your time as well. That's on uh, distribution of traffic between various revisions of your services. So that like I can have multiple services, revisions deployed, and then I have to, I can jumble with the services deployments as well. I can change how many percentages to go to one, how much percentages goes to two. Okay, so, uh, all right, so. <laughs> But it, it takes, maybe it takes, might take 10 minutes or so, if that's okay. Fine, okay. So let me clear this off first. Okay, that eat all. <coughs> okay, so I deleted everything. So let me go to the uh, serving blocks, uh, cd dot dot. Again, if you missed, don't worry. So it's everything is there in my repository. All right. So the first thing, uh, what I'm going to show you now is like, so uh, I have two revisions basically to deploy. Um, for example, I have Java. Uh, this is blog serving part one, right? I'll go to part two. I have config. I have Java. So if you see in the earlier. Uh, stuff which you have seen. Um, so we had something called a service, right? Service internally creates configuration, internally create route, everything done automatically with one holistic object, right? But now in this case, I'm going to do split things up, right? I'm going to do a configuration first, right? Which is again created by service automatically and then saying which, which are the things I have a build. Uh, I have a combination of everything. This is a little bit complicated to read, but imagine that it has a build component, the same build which you used and I have a revision template where I have deployed my image, okay? And I also have one more revision, um, service, one minute, let me see if I have that as well. I'm um, wondering, okay. I have a revision one, I have a revision two, right? It's going to, it's going to, it's going to have just one thing, same image, uh, but only thing is that I have the prefix here. Right, so which means that when I deploy <coughs> this, it's going to create a new revision. All right, so there's going to be two revisions of the same service that is running for you. Right, so let's do that quickly uh, as well. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, I need to create the build k apply dash f uh, build template. I could have had the service earlier, so uh, I don't know why I deleted this. Okay, all right. So now I'm going to go to config, k apply, a chef service, Java config revision one, dot yaml. Okay. So if you see k get parts, let's wait for the parts to come. It's going to be similar thing. It's just going to do the same build again to get all the stuff here, right? While it does the build, so we have one more thing called as routes, right? That's where my application actually reaches inside. So um, I have a route here. So I'll just show you some examples. There are various permutation combinations which you can show here. I'll take one example here. Uh, this is an example where uh, I have a route. I say I have two revisions, greater one and greater two, which is going to be created now. I say that distribute the traffic 75% to V1 and 25% to V2. So when I start pulling it, you will see that there will be a lot of requests going into V1 and V2, right? And it's going to happen dynamically. I'm going to change a couple of rules. Rest, you can try it by yourself. It will show you like how it can kind of change your rules dynamically without redeployment, okay? So does it impact the like, Istio? Like yes, it creates an Istio route behind the scenes. So I'm not touching Istio right now because that digress, that complete topic over to something else, right? So I'm just keeping Istio behind the scenes. So uh, let's see what happened, all right? So you need three, four. Come on, buddy, make it fast. Okay, it's pushed, so you should see the deployment happening right now. 
So what I'm going to do right now is uh, let's also do k apply dash f uh, Java. Okay, this is build. Just need to do a. <coughs> Okay, I'm just going to do the revision 2 as well. So once I do this, oh my gosh. Okay, what we have right now, okay, get pod slash w. So you'll have two deployments right now running for us, right? So I'll just do the first service, uh, what I could call uh, as k, uh, just go one step again. I'll just do the default root k apply cd k apply dash f routes dash route default okay because without route i cannot reach anything right and then bin i say call dot sh right it's going to keep repeating this is going to loop for quite some time let me see if i have the right uh, thing right there okay so let me go here because i keep changing my demo this time it's on the thing. It's uh, just going to be curl migrated dot. So this is going to be one one four, I guess. <coughs> okay. It should come up right now. So, because it's done, so it's it's dead because we have lost thirty seconds. Okay, let's let's see what happens here. So, what is my IP address for this? Okay, it's twenty five. I'm sorry. So we'll see this. Both of these pods come up in a second. Um, Yeah, you see this. So now both of my deployments have come is coming up. I think it's probably the run latest is a default. So it obviously goes to the run latest one for doing the default one. So let's also uh, keep changing. So you keep getting this. Just watch this. Uh, so what I'm going to do is like I'm just going to change CD uh, routes. So one is hello knative OpenShift and then that's the latest revision which is what we have seen. We have passed environment variable called hello. Right now I'm going to say that pass everything to revision 2, right? Okay, apply. If you see that it's going to be uh, apply dash f. Right now what happens is, is a new part getting created for you. The revision 1, revision 2, it's all revision 2 right now. And then now I'm going to change to all to revision one. Okay, so now the revision one is getting deployed because it was not running earlier because always it was going to revision two only, which is the latest. So now it's changing now. Now if you see this, if you see on the right hand side of the uh, stuff, like you'll see, you'll start to see Java K native, which is revision one, and then there is no hello, right? So let's come back to again. So just to say uh, revision one. Um, Rev one dash fifty fifty. Let's put. Okay, sorry. I'm just going to do this fifty fifty now. Now we'll start to see that you'll get hello, couple of hellos, couple of Java. Not exactly fifty fifty, but if you see the overall concurrency distribution, you'll start to see fifty fifty again, right? So you'll see all these things again, and then again, again. What I'm going to do quickly is like I'm just going to say, okay, do more of this, of revision 1, then revision 2, and I'm just going to say this 90% of revision 1 and 10% of revision 2, and then once you see this, so you'll see start to see this thing, more of Java thing coming here, then Canada. once in a blue moon you get hello, which is a revision 2, and rest of all comes to Java, right? In this way, I'm kind of shifting even the serverless way of distributing your application, right? Serverless way of making your application run as a canary, for example, right? I just do this is called what I call a serverless countries. I can make my serverless application do country distribution as well. 
Right? I can change anything I want. I did not do any code redeployments. I did not do anything because Istio is behind the scenes, which will quickly change the routes for you. All right. Any questions? So I think I'm done with my demo. Probably. Thanks for your extra ten minutes. Uh, probably we lost ten minutes earlier, right? So I'm just judging my. <laughs> okay. So uh, let let I allow this to die by itself. So, any questions? So there is more magic, but I've stopped few of the magic there, so because it will be overboarded. So, okay. Uh, Okay, uh, right now I think uh, right now I don't see any gRPC applications you can still deploy. No issues because it's backed by Istio routes. Uh, it's all routes that you define end of the day. So if it's going to be over HTTP behind backed by gRPC protocol, then it's doable. Uh, but the only biggest thing I see is with eventing, which I don't have a demo right now in this session. So eventing is what makes you more interesting. Right, I can send an event from somewhere. Right, right now it uses a cloud event. For example, I can create a cloud uh, machine in AWS and get that cloud event passed to G GCP, right? And then start doing something on GCP, right? It's a cloud uh, agnostic uh, messages that can be exchanged with metadata that I can use in any of these serverless applications. That's something which is which is being done. I don't have a demo as well because I was trying to do uh, streaming with Kafka and other stuff. So which makes it more interesting. And that, that goes itself as a separate session because I cannot be clubbed with this. This is very basic. Probably if you're aware with Kubernetes, then it looks like it's very basic, but otherwise it's a little bit complicated. Uh, but end of the day, these are the very fundamental things you need to know, build, serving, all the things. How do you do a build? How do you change your route? What all the ways to deploy your application, either completely as service or configuration separately, route separately, right? In this case, we use two approaches. First, we did service completely because we are not creating routes separately, but in the second case, we did two deployments separately, configuration, then added routes to it, right? Any routes we want. So both of the ways is possible. All right. Then uh, I'm kind of done. I think I have uh, probably nothing. I think the slides, you can just see it offline. Anyways, I said about eventing. I just, have, I just said about cloud events. I said about events, and then you have the uh, things as told right here. And once you register yourself on the first uh, thing I said, uh, you also can download, uh, you, you saw the developers.data.link. When you go register yourself, you get the free copies of these eBooks. One is on Istio, the new version of this is getting published. And we have one on microservices databases as well, which you can download and see. Um, and then there are also fundamental Kubernetes for JAR developers and reactive applications as well, right? So you can also download all these eBooks is for free once you kind of go register yourself at developers.data.com, right? And that's it, and then you can find the link there, uh, the KN, KN serving, where you can find the same deck. I also have something called as a fast tutorial. I need to update that for Knative. Um, and then you can also go to learn.openshift.com slash serverless to read, to do things by yourself without installing anything. Any further questions, obviously you can reach out to me. I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank, thank you. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't no worry, it's my pleasure. Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. The last thing was interesting. Please give me the email. That was the question I was about to ask in the video conference. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking about the.